So for those joining us, thank you for being here. And I ask that when you join, if you mute yourself, we're gonna kick things off in just a couple of minutes and let uh, some more people join the meeting. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Dan to kick things off. Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome to the Zone Tosa for All meeting. Uh, my name is Dan, and I'm going to play a piece of music for you guys today. It's called Sunny uh, by Bobby Hebb. So hope you guys enjoy. So much, Dan. That is that is a hard act to follow, but I will try my best. We so appreciate you being here, um, and thank you all uh, for joining us tonight. I know it's beautiful weather outside, so we really appreciate you being here. 
And I am Marisa Schultz. I am with All Together, and we are working alongside our amazing team, who will introduce themselves here in a bit, um, the city of Wauwatosa and the community to make zoning and land use more equitable in Wauwatosa. We are just kicking off this process. This is our first community meeting that we have. So we're really excited to hear your thoughts and get your input tonight. And I know that a lot of you have some questions about what this process looks like and what it's all about. I think a lot of them will be addressed in our presentations and in our discussions, but we encourage you to drop any questions that you have in the chat. And if they are not addressed tonight, then we'll make sure that we answer those and post those to the project website. And Rachel is going to drop a link to that website. There we'll have updates on the project, upcoming meetings that you can continue to stay involved. Um, so we really appreciate it. So I, before we really kick things off, I just wanted to kind of quickly go through the agenda for this evening. So we're going to have a series of presentations about what we'll be covering tonight in terms of, of land use and zoning and, and uh, engagement. And then we're going to break out into smaller group discussions and to get your feedback and answer your questions. And then we're gonna have a, a group report back at the end of the session. And we'll talk about next steps and ways that you can stay involved. But before we kick things off, we would like to get a sense of what zoning and the word zoning comes to mind for all of you when we say, what is zoning? So with that being said, we are gonna ask you to take out your smartphones if you have one and you can either scan the QR code, it will take you directly to um, a website, or you can on your, on your smartphone or on your cell phone or even on another tab on your computer, go to menti.com, and then you'll see that you have to put in a code, and that code is here in orange, okay? So you can either scan this or go to menti.com and put in the code that is on the screen, and I'm gonna to switch to Menti in just a moment. And again, for those of you still trying to access this, you can have the code at the top of the screen. It's 2663096. So when you hear the word zoning, what comes to mind? So many great contributions. And if someone puts in the same word, you'll see that it grows larger. So restrictions okay, is, is one common theme. Planning, redlining, which we'll talk about tonight. So a lot of the different uses, commercials, businesses, industry, housing, Rules is also coming up. I'm going to give people about 30 more seconds to add their responses. Responsible growth, government control. So it looks like planning, rules, restrictions, and protection are kind of those major themes. So thank you all for contributing. We'll make sure that this is kind of captured in some of our community engagement analysis. And I am going to now turn it over to Janine, who's with P3 Development. Well, thank you, Marisa, and good evening, everyone. Again, welcome to the first Zone Tulsa for All public workshop. Like Marisa said, it's great weather today. So I know you could be anywhere, but you chose to be with us. And so we say thank you. My name is Janine Edwards. I'm a partner with P3 Development Group. We are a local boutique professional services firm, we like to say, that specializes in engagement, equity, and inclusion. 
Uh, we also like to think that we're a trusted partner of government agencies here in our region. We are pleased to support this engagement effort and joining excellent partners, Duncan Associates and Together, all, I'm sorry, all together. Duncan Associates has previously worked with the city on your comprehensive zoning ordinance update, and they specialize in assisting local governments that set plans and policies in motion and all together is a place-based creative agency focused on equitable community engagement. Let's just say we have a lot in common and together we've designed an engagement process that lifts up conversations that are important to the future of the city of Wauwatosa. Next slide. As many of you all know, Wauwatosa is advancing several key initiatives to create a more equitable community. These initiatives include those that are here on your screen and this effort aligns with the external development pathway. This important work is being done in partnership with the Citizen-Led Equity and Inclusion Commission that was formed in 2019. And we understand that Wauwatosa was historically meant to be exclusive. We can be really honest about that. But you have decided to co-create a new and different vision for how Tosa can and will prosper. And we commend you really for just embracing the change at this important time in our collective history and also collectively deciding what's most important to you for today, but also in the future. So with that, uh, there's been a lot of talk these days about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but what does that mean for Wauwatosa? Next slide. So we were able to obtain working definitions from the Equity and Inclusion Commission, which we've adopted for this process. And I won't read these definitions word for word, but briefly, equity is the cornerstone of this zoning and land use project. Equity is grounded in fairness and justice and the desire to eliminate barriers for all, taking into consideration that real disparities, they really exist and they exist within our communities. Next slide. Inclusion, it's my favorite, and it's all about creating a sense of belonging. Uh, during one of our community conversations, someone shared that there's a big difference from feeling welcome to feeling like you actually belong. And an inclusive Wauwatosa deliberately embraces all. Next slide. Finally, diversity. Diversity includes all the ways that people are different. And there are many dimensions of diversity, although oftentimes people really think first about race, ethnicity, or gender. But broader definitions include things like age, socioeconomic status, disability, sexual orientation, and all of those that are included here on this slide. And let's not forget one that's really important, and that's just diversity of thought. We hope conversation like today's will encourage brave sharing in a safe environment that your opinions can really be shared courageously and with respect. Next slide. We have a set specific set of goals like most of these processes do, which include identifying and revising zoning and land use regulations and processes to address issues like lack of affordable housing options, limited access to mobility and transportation, unwelcoming attitudes, kind of what I just said about the difference between belonging and feeling welcome. What does that mean for outsiders? Gentrification and displacement, a lot of talk about that these days. Lack of investment in disadvantaged businesses, negative health outcomes and environmental injustice, and most importantly, a lack of engagement, something we'll share more about today. We're very excited to work collaboratively with you to set a new course for the future of Wauwatosa. Next slide. And finally, here's our project timeline. We recognize that it's aggressive, but it's intentional. And we're at the very early stages of this process. And so we're happy that you're joining, uh, joining us at the beginning of this journey. We kicked off the engagement process in April with a series of community conversations with a diverse representation of Wauwatosa residents that helped shape today's process. A big thank you to everyone that's here this evening who helped participate and help us shape these discussions moving forward. Which brings us to today, our first public workshop. We made it, we're here. 
And then we'll be on our way in June, June and July, where we'll develop a draft set of recommendations for zoning changes grounded in equity. And then at the end of July, we'll have another round of community conversations. And then finally in August, the second public workshop where we'll share the final set of recommendations. We hope you make every effort to join us on this journey. And now I'd like to hand it over to Kirk, who's gonna share a little bit more about the themes that are grounding this work. Thank you, Janine. Good evening, everyone. Let me add my thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. You know, this project in our minds is founded at least partly on a belief that making progress on the equity and inclusion front demands that we first re-examine and acknowledge our past. So I want to spend a minute or so at the outset um, exploring the sometimes uneven or troubled history of planning and zoning in the U.S. Since the early 20th century, for over 100 years, communities throughout this country have used zoning to organize land uses, minimize conflicts between different activities or different intensities of activities, or as our planning school textbooks taught us, to protect the public health, safety, and general welfare of citizens and the environment. With greater time, with the passage of time, with greater awareness, however, we're, lo we're learning that zoning, if you wouldn't mind advancing the slide, um, we're learning that zoning has separated more than just land uses. It has also worked to separate and sometimes exclude people. In the early 1900s, some cities used zoning explicitly to create separate areas for black, white, and immigrant households. It's a practice we know in the planning field today as racial zoning. When the practice of explicit racial zoning was ruled unconstitutional over 100 years ago by the Supreme Court, cities and even the federal government persisted in seeking legally defensible ways to separate people based on race, income, and social status. Such practices include what we now refer to as economic or exclusionary zoning that has worked to make some neighborhoods off limits for those without the means to afford a single family home. Until about the 1950s, exclusionary zoning policies were sometimes supplemented by racial restrictive private covenants, which were used by developers and private property owners throughout the US, including Wauwatosa and throughout the Milwaukee area to prohibit African-American households from moving into predominantly white neighborhoods. Exclusionary zoning was also sometimes combined with mortgage loan lending policies, again, sanctioned by the federal government, whereby lenders refused to approve mortgages and issue mortgage loan insurance to households within specific mostly white neighborhoods, a practice that we all know today as redlining. Again, something that was prevalent throughout the major metropolitan urban areas, including the Milwaukee area. Regardless of intention, zoning rules and other government policies have had and continue to have disproportionate impacts on some segments of the population. For this reason, we think of zoning as having a dual legacy today, sometimes promoting the public good and other times fostering inequity and exclusion. We believe that since government played a role, sometimes a key role in producing these inequitable outcomes, we believe it also has an important role to play in working to establish a more equity focused future. When it comes to promoting equity, Housing is undoubtedly one of the most fundamental issues. Put simply, housing and place matter tremendously. Quality affordable housing anchors families. Where we live affects nearly everything in our lives. Where we work, how we get there, the quality of schools that our children attend, our health and safety, even our longevity or lifespan. Zoning regulations by their very nature place limits on the type and number of housing units that can be constructed in a community. These restrictions in turn have the effect of limiting housing supply 
and reducing options, particularly for lower income households, working families, older persons, and those with disabilities. A little over a year ago, the city of Wauwatosa helped spearhead an effort to perform a regional analysis of impediments to fair housing choice and access. Now, this was a collaborative effort where the city worked with Milwaukee and West Allis and the surrounding counties um, on an effort recognizing that fair housing is an issue that's regional, not, not hyper-local. The study completed in the fall of last year identified several significant obstacles to securing fair housing choice and access throughout the region. These issues include single family zones that are exclusive in nature that only permit single family homes, large minimum lot size that tend to drive up the cost of housing and make fewer units available, and strict limitations on the density of new housing that can be constructed. Restrictive policies limiting housing options for persons with disabilities, those living in group homes and community living arrangements, for example, are another identified impediment within the region. Community resistance to new housing, to change in general, particularly higher density multifamily housing, can be a significant barrier to addressing fair housing needs. Also, the mismatch between lower and middle income jobs and housing for the workforce that fills those jobs can also be an impediment as can be the lack of transportation options for lower income workers. In response to these types of issues, cities around the country are rethinking their approach to zoning by expanding the range of housing types permitted in various zoning classifications. It's, as a planner, it's hard to pick up uh, a, a newsletter or an article about planning where we're not learning about communities that are expanding once exclusive single family zones to incorporate or allow additional housing types. Other communities are changing or completely undoing restrictions on housing density as a way to address those sorts of impediment. Still other communities are encouraging higher density, more walkable development patterns, particularly along transportation corridors and close to transit service, a uh, technique known as transit-oriented development for those planners in the world. Others are addressing sometimes misguided, unfounded fears about change by allowing more types of housing as of right, without a public hearing. Still others are requiring that larger multi-unit housing projects include a certain number of affordable workforce housing units, something that's commonly done in Wauwatosa, for example, for projects seeking local government financial assistance. Beyond housing per se, communities are reducing, sometimes completely eliminating government imposed off street parking requirements as a way to free up land for additional housing or for new business growth and development. Because those, those government imposed off street parking requirements can affect both the cost of housing and the cost of starting a new business and work against the city's objective for creating more walkable neighborhoods. Other cities and local governments are working to remove unnecessary bureaucratic permitting obstacles for small businesses, uh, which can have really positive impacts for uh, disadvantaged minority owned businesses and small businesses in general. Still other communities are re-examining their public notification requirements, for example, that have historically focused on sending notice to nearby property owners and instead insisting that notices go to all nearby residents, not just the, uh, those who are privileged to own property. Nearly all communities doing this sort of work are working to make the regulations easier to understand and specifically incorporating equity considerations as factors to be considered when evaluating new development requests, something that has not historically been the case. As we break into smaller groups tonight to hear from you, we're asking that you weigh in on these and other types of issues and help us identify other zoning and planning related policies that could be modified to ensure greater equity and inclusion in Wauwatosa. Now I'm gonna hand the 
hand the microphone to Marisa to discuss ways in which the city's processes, procedures, and engagement techniques affect the goal of promoting greater equity and working to create a city that is zoned for all. Thank you, Kirk, I appreciate it. So a big part of making zoning and land use decisions more equitable is really how you engage stakeholders so there's meaningful outreach and that people have a voice and, and access to decision-making and the decision-making process. The city's planning and communications department are already doing a lot of work to promote public meetings and engage residents. They have an e-public comment system on their website that's used for development projects so that residents can submit comments. And those comments are then provided to the plan commission, standing committee, and common council. And then of course the city also holds public meetings to explain the project and take Q&A if there's a major development project. Uh, the develop developer is also required to send out hard copy invites to neighboring property owners for these meetings. And the city also uses social media. They have very active social media accounts to really help spread the word about public events and hearings. So while there are these engagement mechanisms in place to really create a more equitable zoning and land use process, there needs to be a broadened outreach to ensure that more renters, low income households, youth, the disability community, people of color and aging individuals have the opportunity to participate. And that everyone that does participate can see how their input and their feedback was noted and considered in, in these projects and processes. But that's a tall order, especially right now after COVID, right? So something, I think it's something that's much easier to talk about and harder in execution. And so what I'd like to do right now um, is to have Rachel just bring up a poll. And I'd like to get a sense of how many of you have gone to a city meeting or a public hearing in the last five years. And because I'm sharing my screen, I'll have Rachel um, pull that up and, and then read some of the results. I think so. We'll give you a couple minutes, or not a couple minutes, about 30 seconds to complete the poll and then we'll share the results so that you can see them. Okay, I'll give you a 10 second warning. Well, it looks like we've got an involved group of people here. Um, so I'm gonna share the results. Looks like 59% of you have been to 10 or more um, city meetings or public hearings, which is amazing. We've got about 15% who've been to five to nine meetings um, in the last five years. One to four is about 18%, another 8% who've been to, to zero. So it's just a nice way to, to you know, see who's in the room and understand what your experience is with, you know, city meetings and public hearings in the past. And so for those of you who haven't participated or participated frequently, I think a lot of people express, you know, having having issues or, or troubles accessing the meetings, either because of their location or their time, they have family commitments um, and different schedules going on. And so we really want to work with the city um, and, and look at other communities like Denver and Minneapolis and their surrounding communities that are really changing the model of engagement and doing it effectively. And so through this process, we'll look at what those other communities are doing and how it's been successful. And, and then we'll consider what makes sense here for Wauwatosa. And some of the things that, that we've noticed that is, is working in other communities is identifying who isn't a part of the process, who is not actually here in these meetings. And I think you'll probably find that a lot of those people have not participated in a number of meetings you know, in the last five years. Um, and then thinking about what are the goals and the strategies and the metrics, so keeping it very transparent to involve them and get them more involved in decision-making and educating people so they know how city planning, zoning, and land use processes work. It can be complicated, but as Kirk mentioned, there is a way to simplify it. And so I think that will be a big goal. Um, and then building trust by creating space to listen and heal. And I think Janine focused on this. It's far easier to think about the future and what we can change to be more equitable 
But a part of that is for this community to maybe feel a little uncomfortable about talking about what's happened in the community in the past in regards to zoning and land use and, and what's gotten us here, like redlining and restrictive covenants that Kirk talked about. And I think by acknowledging those past harms, we can learn from them and open up a whole new dialogue about why everyone's voice matters in deciding what their community looks like. And then of course, thinking about engagement fatigue. And it sounds like you're a hardy group who have been to a number of meetings, but it can be a lot, especially one after another. So how can you group engagement together so you're really making um, an impact, making sure you're engaging people in a way where their voice matters, it's being incorporated, but um, you're being very efficient about the way that you do that. So with that being said, I'd love to hand it over to Janine so we can get started on our breakout sessions and hear more of your thoughts. Thank you. So I know we've been doing a lot of talking, uh, but now it's time for you to share your ideas. So in a few moments, everyone will be sent to one of five um, different breakout rooms. In these rooms, uh, you'll be joined by a facilitator, including myself and four others from our planning team, who will guide the discussions and then also note takers from the city. Over the next 30 minutes or so um, in each group, you'll be able to share your thoughts on the impacts of inequity in zoning and land use, and also to share your thoughts about goals. So where do you wanna move as a community around the three themes that we've shared? We'll be utilizing, I like to say a nifty cool tool called Jamboard, which will allow for us to digitally and visually share your ideas and to be able to see them as we collaborate. And we'll first talk about the impacts get some things up on the Jamboard and then move on to goals. And then we'll come back to our large group to report out about 7.10 or so. So we have a few, a few ground rules that are up on the screen. I just wanna quickly touch on those. We encourage you to speak openly and honestly. Uh, this is a public involvement process. So we want to hear from you. We want you to be transparent around your thoughts. Uh, this is an opportunity to also listen and to respect others as they share and as we explore our different perspectives. And then finally, we have limited time, so we want to make sure that we share the airtime. So I think that's it for us. I think we have these areas here that we want to hear from you around housing, choice and affordability, mobility and transportation, gentrification, perception of outsiders, public engagement environmental justice and business investment, just to give you some examples. Um, but I think that's it. And then we're gonna turn it over to Rachel and she's gonna send us out into our rooms. Okay, hi all. So I'm gonna click open all rooms and you should um, see something pop up that says join breakout room um, something. There are some people who are unassigned but I see now that I'm gonna move. So if you see something Go ahead and join. Uh, if you don't, then just wait a minute and I will assign you. Oh, Marisa, I can assign you to room three. There you go. Okay, everyone should be able to be in their rooms. Casey, I'm gonna go ahead and make you the host. So now you are in charge of the breakout rooms. So if anyone has trouble, ask Casey. I'm gonna go ahead and, can you assign me to breakout room four? <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you guys all. I know we're just coming back now, so we'll give everyone a second. And then Marisa, do you wanna kinda kick things off in terms of recap? Yeah, sure. You would. Well, I don't know if you're, or we can start with, with um, Jeannie from, from group yeah, one. Yeah, that would be great. Your okay. <laughs> Janine, do you want to give us a, a recap on on what you heard from your group? Yeah, there were there were we had a great discussion. Let me start there. Um, I think we had a lot of conversation about the importance of addressing the housing um, challenges and issues for people with disabilities, and how there are not a lot of options that really align with their needs. Um, we also had a conversation about. Uh, the impacts that really are framed from the fact that whiteness is normalized in Wauwatosa. And what does that mean for the community? What does that mean for young people and their decision to um, continue to live in Tulsa, but also to engage in the world? And then we also talked about transportation options being really limited. Um, and then in around that category around promoting transparency and engagement, we had a, a lot of conversation about engagement fatigue, um, the real challenges that people have uh, being able to engage in process and quite honestly, a lack of a feedback loop and a feeling of just a lack of transparency and accountability uh, when it comes to engaging with elected officials. Um, thinking about the future and thinking about our goals, where we'd like to be in the future, we had some discussion about the importance of creating um, a good balance of mixed use option, greater patterns of mixed use, and also a diversity of options for renters and buyers, understanding that there are some that don't want a high rise. And so what does that mean for the diversity of options? Um, also talking about goals around uh, transparency, how might we continue to engage in this virtual and hybrid environment, understanding that many people have been able to use this and engage in ways that they haven't been able to in the past, and that could be an opportunity for greater input, clear conversation, greater accountability and transparency. Those are some of the high level themes that came from our conversation. Thank you, Janine. Okay, I'll move on to this next one. Jordan, ooh, a colorful board. What did you hear from your group? I'm on mute. Uh, great conversation. I think there was a lot of overlap with what was discussed in the, the first breakout group um, as far as accessibility um, for seniors and um, the people who don't have access to um, lower housing, um, but affordability was was one of the, the things we were talking about, how the area is pricing potential residents out of the out of the Wauwatosa area. Um, accessibility in the housing stock, um, lack of single story accessible housing. Um, and then we talked a little bit about um, how uh, lack of transportation was one that came up a lot, how there's very limited transportation as far as getting around Tulsa comfortably and quickly. Um, there really is not really an ideal situation for that. Um, one of the examples was used where one of the residents is only about two, two miles from um, the medical college or campus and it, it would take it, it would take a car having to have a car to get there. So there really is no way around um, no real concrete way of what transportation options are out there to kind of mitigate that. So that's what's a, a major one. Um, Seriously? Hello? Um, yeah, so um, some of the goals you talked about too were really around leveraging the powers of the school as far as when we we're getting the community happenings out so that we can use the schools and the businesses to kind of leverage those words and to let the community know what's happening. Um, and then one thing we were just talking about before we got out was the agendas for the meetings for the public hearings come out just the day or the, the Friday, the draft is out and then the Monday before the meetings. So if we can get those agendas out a little bit quicker so that we can get more um, disseminated to the community so that they're aware of what's going on and they can have more public insight or, or say in what the agenda is gonna be about. So just being notified a little bit quicker of what those agendas are being um, gonna be talking about at those public hearings. 
Great, thank you, Jordan. Thanks, Paulette, for taking such colorful notes. Okay, ooh, lots to talk yeah. about. Good we're gonna prove that had a lot. So I can't, this is, I was like, I'm gonna let someone else just go before me. There's a lot to summarize here. And I know I'm not gonna capture it all. Um, and in fact, probably very little, but I, I do think that there was a lot of overlap as Jordan mentioned with what Janine and Jordan have just recapped. Um, and one was just the need for more affordable housing and that that doesn't necessarily need to look like, um, you know, very high density, that there's a lot of opportunities where zoning is predominantly single family in the city. And so thinking about how can we integrate more of a, and someone used this term, gentle density, you know, or a lower density of duplex and fourplexes to um, within the, the fabric of single family neighborhoods. And then thinking about if there is more an increased density, instead of having to widen our roads or increase traffic, let's think about really investing in um, more public transportation and to kind of accommodate that density. We heard a lot about, um, you know, just kind of this engagement fatigue that Jordan talked about um, and Janine and that there are a lot of planning processes going on. And it seems like very, you know, active residents in, in Tosa who want to be involved, but feel like their input is not necessarily being, you know, transferred over into or shared among uh, planning projects and projects that are going on and also kind of just the results of those plans just to make sure that um, everyone is coordinating so that people feel like when they're providing input it's valued and they can kind of see how that is playing out in, in the projects um, that are going on in the city. Um, and then I think just that focus on, you know, there's just like a, a lot of a lack of, of housing and options for seniors and also multi-generational families. So thinking about how we can address that through this process. Um, in terms of the goals, um, you know, the, I, I just talked about those, but thinking about um, how we can make it easier for small businesses um, to go through the permitting process because it can be really challenging and a huge barrier. Uh, and then thinking about, again, just the lowering minimum lot sizes and frontage requirements and also parking requirements to enhance density. Um, and then we had uh, one participant who's a planner and just said, let's think about where in the city density should go because there's gonna be the pressure there. And then kind of thinking about more of this, this gentle density as I mentioned in, in other parts of the city. So we had some great conversations. Awesome, thank you, Marisa. Okay, this was our breakout room. Brian, take some very organized post-it notes. Um, so we talked about the similar themes, the affordability being a real challenge for first time homeowners wanting to move to Tosa, as well as, um, you know, the hard to find other housing options like a duplex, affordable duplexes um, were really hard to find as well as affordable senior housing. You know, people talked about their their parents wanting to, you know, age in place and stay in the community and, and that was difficult. Um, the we talked about, you know, finding homes for, you know, family members with disabilities and that it, it was really hard to find any existing housing stock that had that and it was more cost effective to, you know, build a home that could accommodate that rather than find anything that was existing. Um, we talked about kind of the, the perception of like white Tosa, that there was a perceived, um, you know, fear of outsiders and the way that people speak about, you know, the, the community can have some coded language sometimes that feels unwelcoming. Um, we heard about uh, rent landlords not taking rental assistance and that being a challenge to have helping to um, help, help people find housing in Wauwatosa. Um, the, and then how that connects to transit, that oftentimes the housing that is affordable in Mauritius is not walkable or in areas near transit. We heard about, you know, neighborhoods that don't have sidewalks and how that impacts, um, you know, people's mobility. Um, and then the opposition that comes from implementing transit in the community, that there is a fear of, you know, the people who might come in if transit comes. And so, you know, trying to address those perceptions of transit when, you know, we also address that transit helps everyone access jobs and opportunity in Mauritosa. Um, we also talked a lot about the, the engagement and transparency and, you know, the difficulty to find uh, meeting agendas and understand what meetings are happening when and, um, you know, even sometimes when the meeting starts, then the agenda, if you're five minutes after the agenda isn't online anymore. So, 
making the process just more clear to understand of, of here's the, the ways to participate um, and here's how your participation will be taken into account. Um, you know, we, we talked about businesses a little bit and, and businesses being forced to locate in, in other parts of, you know, the Milwaukee area because the cost to start a business in Milwaukee is so high. Um, and, you know, opportunities in creating more entrepreneurial startup like spaces, um, co working spaces that can help get people um, more, make it more accessible for people to open businesses in Malatosa. And then for a goals perspective, um, you know, we talked about the idea of a citizen engagement academy to help people learn how to participate in government. Um, we talked about, um, you know, the institutional and cultural structures that need to change to help people feel like they are welcome, that everyone is welcome in Wauwatosa, um, and that the community can reflect the diversity that is found in, the, in, in certain schools in the community, that the diversity is there, but it's just not community-wide. Um, we talked about, you know, needing support for uh, things like affordable housing and transit and having people who will come out and say yes and advocate for these sorts of things. Um, you know, that the goal is for Wauwatosa to be a really desirable place to learn, the most desirable place to learn um, and, and grow and work and play in the whole state for anyone who wants to be here and that people will choose this place because of its diversity. So those are some of the things that we talked about. Um, Kirk, are you? I know Kirk had some internet issues. Are you back yet? I don't, I don't know if I see you. I, I don't know if you see me. I I've, I'm now on my phone. You. Can, can you hear me? I can hear you. So we're gonna right. right on the spotlight. You wanna talk apparently about- I, I, group? Apparently we haven't paid our internet bill, um, <laughs> but I have paid my phone bill. Let me try and recap what I think was the finest group of the five, I'm sure. I, I didn't see your groups, but uh, we had a very productive discussion, um, great group, uh, some significant commonalities of themes um, in, our, in our discussion. Uh, we talked a fair amount about the lack of uh, options for older residents to sort of age in place in, in Wauwatosa, as well as the absence of um, a, a range of really robust. Uh -oh. Do we lose you? Did I lose me? A little bit. Keep talking and we'll let you know. Otherwise, we might pass it to Amy. Okay, um, or just in our session as well. Um, uh, interesting discussion about uh, while recognizing the need to accommodate um, uh, folks of, of varying ages, ability, and income levels, there was significant interest in not repeating the, the mistakes of the past in terms of segregating those folks or having an area for older folks versus folks with disabilities versus young families uh, encourage neighborhoods that have space for all within them. That was a, a really good part of our discussion. Uh, the issue of naturally occurring affordable housing came up and trying to preserve uh, the city's remaining stock of those units to the maximum extent possible, which of course ties into the issue of gentrification as well. So um, we found that very interesting. A point was made early on that uh, when we talk about houses and homes, we need to include uh, apartments and, and, multi, and, and units in multi-unit buildings as, as homes and houses as well. And, and you guys will remember that we talked about that a fair amount in our focus group sessions earlier on in the project. Um, oh, uh, interesting discussion too about an examination of underutilized and underdeveloped property in the city. Uh, reference was made to a lot of one and two story professional office buildings with small, small or medium sized surface parking lots that uh, there was a feeling among some that those could be put to more productive use, whether for housing or for business growth and development. Um, and then uh, finally, I'll close out by saying one of the goals that came up in our discussion was a more purposeful and um, uh, uh, intentional discussion of what Wauwatosa wants to be, both in terms of 
the discussions we're having today, but in terms of the size of the community and the number of residents that can be accommodated in the community as providing some context for future discussions about growth and development. Um, I thought that was a real intriguing um, discussion point as well. Thank you, Kirk. I think we're gonna pass it off to Marisa to kind of close us out and talk about next steps. Yes. I'm gonna just share my screen here. Okay, great. Is Janine, um, you know, I know she pulled up this slide earlier and talked through these. So uh, we are going to come back and take all of our input that we have gotten from the community conversations and this workshop. We are going to send a follow up survey, which will capture some of the stuff that we talked about tonight, but some additional questions. Um, and we'll send you all an email with that. And um, by early next week, we would love to get your additional input. It would be great. And please feel free to, to, to share it on for those who were not able to attend this evening. So we can make sure that we're capturing all of uh, everyone's feedback in the community. And then we're gonna go to work, working on recommended zoning changes and an equity center approach. So thinking about some of those engagement policies that makes it more transparent and reduces that engagement fatigue that we talked about. Um, and we're going to present those um, recommended changes and drafts to the groups that are involved in the community conversations, refine them a bit, and then have a second public workshop where we will invite you all back to present some of our draft recommendations and to get your feedback. We'll make sure that's a really interactive workshop. Um, and then we're looking to kind of finalize our recommendations by early fall. So I know that some of you have some hands up and some questions. We're getting kind of near the end of the workshop, but I would encourage you to um, please drop your questions in the chat or Rachel, if you can um, put my email in the chat, please feel free to send me any additional questions. I'll make sure that they're forwarded to the right person on our team and to the city and that we provide answers and responses to all of your questions. And again, we'll post that to the project website. We will also have um, an engagement summary that's posted in the next couple of weeks. We wanna make sure that we include the feedback from the survey. So give us a couple of weeks on that and we'll email all of you that summary and post it to the website as well. So thank you all for being here. We're giving you enough time to go out and enjoy the last of this beautiful day. Um, so thanks again and have a wonderful evening. Thank you everyone.